about to go down. J.D. Domino with the back okay. with Sean Russell. And Sean's like jumping right in today, and it's great. We are going to have the backstory of the DJs. Sean's been around, I've been around, and we're just going to find out about what's going on with today's music, what happened back in the day, why did we get into this field? And let's start that out. Sean, uh, how long have you been DJing and why? Why? Well, why? <laughs> let's <laughs> see. Uh, I mean, I always had I was like a crazy love music. Uh, I mean, when I was young, I want to say I bought my first set of 1200s when I was like 13 years old at Rock Records, you know, because I was always I was always going on at Rock Dreams. And I was like, hey, what do you got hot dance music wise? Uh, Oh, I'm not really in the dance music, you know, and and then, (laughs) of course, I always made my ways down in the Trenton to uh, go to Ace Record Shop, sound the sounds of the Trenton, So. I mean, that's kind of where I started, but I really started off listening to, like, hip-hop, you know, you know, like the Sugar Hill Gang, and, you know, Curtis right. Blow, and, you know, Fantasy Five. I mean, that's where the hip-hop era really started for me. And then as time won, you know, I, I started to watch a lot of the DJs when I was younger, and I was like, wow, man, this is really cool. These guys, these guys just music they're like making music you know and i just learned from them guys i mean there's a lot of a lot of great djs in this area that people forget about you know i had uh my cousin i had extra tickets for um remember the um budweiser super fresh when they used to have it you were probably a little oh, yeah. back then. well yeah, i, I first saw ll cool j but uh fat boys yeah i was there uh, Run DMC, Grandmaster, all the yep, legends fact. were there. Yep. And my cousin I'll goes, yeah, my cousin's like, nah. they just put a record on and they rap on it. After the concert, he goes, them DJs are like the drummers. They're making the music back there. Yep. And he took a different light because remember back in the day, it was always mocks. Everybody <laughs> thought, oh, they just put a yeah. record on and they – wrap over top of it, but you never realized they were the ones creating. And now look at them. A lot yeah, of them it was, are your top producers. Well, it, it, I mean, you can you can really go back. I mean, well, I mean, we can start at a local level. And like the local around here, you know, there was there were some unbelievable DJs back in the day. I mean, there's guys in this area who actually have won the board best D award in the country. Right. You know, there was a guy go oh, back in the day, uh, Phil Mancine, you know, he was the right. billboard day of the year, you know, and it was funny. I, I kind of, as I got, as I started getting a little bit older, I mean, I, I was, I was kind of like getting to know these guys. Like, you know, there was, there was Jerome Martucci. There was, you know, Greg Blair, there was Tony Nini, you know, there was um, Frankie D, there was Frankie Olivetti, you know, and these guys, you know, and uh, I, I got to, I got to, I got to met guy because he really, he was really a force back in the day, uh, Joe Macaroni. Joe Macaroni, like when I was a young kid, I used to go to like dances and it was him, you know, and I was like, I was like watching this guy. I'm like, and this is like unbelievable, man. He's taking two sounds and he's putting it together. And, you know, I kind of think where I started really enjoying, you know, the whole DJ aspect of it. I was playing with them guys and they never gave me the respect because of the bar I was in. I was at the Buffstone <laughs> and the Buffstone was your rock joint. Well, that's. And they never got the credibility as the Granada Brothers and all the other dance places, even down. Um, when they used to play at the coastline in different places in Philly. Yeah. And I remember Bibbs, the manager, I want to hook you up. I want to get you in over here at the Granada. And half of the guys that you just mentioned, except for Frankie, the mailman, Frankie D was yeah. the best. He, he pulled me on the side. He goes, hey, Domino, you'll never make it here. I says, why? He goes, the boys don't want you here. They don't have no credibility yeah. for you because you work at the Buffstone. And they'd rather do rock and fall on their face. 
because they wanted to try to do a Sunday night rock night. The funny thing is, yeah. I was a disco boy at heart. I didn't know rock. I didn't know nothing when I got to yeah. the Buff Stone. I didn't even like Led Zeppelin. Right. I didn't like the Beatles. All the top bands <laughs> I wasn't into. I was more of that Saturday Night Fever type guy. <laughs> and like you mentioned with Ace. Yeah. Ace used to be the place to go. And did you ever get uh, escorted to the car on a weekend? Oh yeah, to... I mean, <laughs> it was funny. It was funny. I had such, I had such, such a relationship with Scoop. It was funny. Uh, I, I mean, there's, I, I'm a young. Just imagine, like, I'm this young kid, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, I'm in a really not so neighborhood, and he's like, okay, but you know what's funny? After a while, all the guys in there knew me, and they were. It was kind of funny because, I mean, Scoop knew. Like I was always into, I always want, I always prided myself like trying to one step ahead of everybody. Right. And it was kind of weird because I used to come in and Scoop would be like, hey, Sean, I got some stuff for you in the back. You want to look at it? Or I put it out. Like he used to let me look at the promos and stuff before he even put them out. You know, and he, it, right. you know, but it, it's, but he knew, like Scoop knew, like, my love for music and that's kind of how i got to know him so well and the funny thing is if you went over there on the weekends because it was in a bad section today i won't even go yeah. by there but um yeah he used to always have a couple of the uh guys the kids hey do me a favor walk into his car because if they see a yeah. white guy walking in that neighborhood it's either a drug deal or you're going to uh ace <laughs> <laughs> because why else would you be at the monument but uh, I don't know if you remember uh, uh, Bill Singer. He had the broadcast. Oh, yeah. Down. And same thing with Bill. I grew up with Bill. That's where I went. I met a lot of guys through Bill that used to DJ for me. And uh, Bill would be the same way. He'd walk you in, walk you to your car, and nobody would bother you. But they were the areas back then. You know, you didn't want to be yeah, around. Yeah, I mean, if you want to. But you know what's funny? Them guys just knew about music. Oh, yeah. But that's how, uh, like, even with Ace, with the music, he knew I played rock, but he also knew I knew dance music, and I was always looking for something new that could cross, and he would do the same thing every yeah. week. Hey, I got something for you. Check it out. Rock Dreams used yeah. to go over there all the time, and even Princeton Record Exchange, and then um, the Record Collector. I don't know if you remember the Record Collector, yeah. the old Howard Stern wannabe. Oh, yeah. Well, he looked like him. Absolutely. He Absolutely. He would know exactly what you want. He'd go, let me go to the basement. He'd come down, bring up all the 45s and say, here you go. You can't and do it he was funny. It was so funny. He used to be so funny because I remember when in there and he'd be like, and he had no, he had no desire for dance music. <laughs> the record collector. And right. it was funny. He used to say, I mean, I used to make my rounds, like, when, this is when we used to record shop. I used to, like, make my rounds and go there, and he'd be like, hey, Sean, I got this crate set aside. This guy came in with all this junk, he used to say to me, all this junk. And I remember pulling stuff out of there, like, like Disco Nights by GQ, and it's like this. And he'd, be, and he'd be like, are you sure you want that? And I was like, yeah, I want it. You know? You're and, hitting and the then, lottery, and, and he's he, thinking he's throwing garbage at Yeah. You. Yeah, and he well, I he probably he probably learned a few things from me after the, over the years because I remember going in there one time and looking at some prices on some disco records that he did have. He had a lot of good imports back then. That's what I used to get off of him because I like with the rocks. I would always look for different alternatives. Like yes, they came yeah. out with a lot of dance twelve inches. Easy Top had some different groups, and that's yeah. where even Bon Jovi because back then. Oh, God, I got tired of playing Bon Jovi, but that was that was the way, you know, the women would come in all the time and ask you, you got Bon Jovi? No. <laughs> you know, it's like, how many times did you hear the song in the car on the way here? Now you got to hear it another time? I have a theory about DJing. I mean, and I've always had this theory, you know, and listen, granted, there's a lot of great DJs and, you know, 
but like it, it was weird like when house music first came out i was already listening to it and then people just started to catch on to it you know and then as time went on you know i happened to meet a few guys through the years and i was like you know and one guy really taught me a lot about how to you know take a song and i have to give him credit his name's scott dolsey and he used to okay. be a dj but he was he's He's really, really musically talented. And he would like say, you know, Sean, he's playing a record is playing a record. He goes, every time you want to play a record, you want to kind of make it your own. Oh, and he goes, and then give people like the little bit of a wow factor. Like, oh, I haven't heard that, you know? And that's kind of like how I evolved to taking a song and making it my own. Give it a different variation. And that's they said going back in the day with Black Box. Uh, who was it, Loretta exactly. Holloway? Or uh, I always mix up uh, Holloway and um, Martha Wash. No, well, it was it was Holiday on the first. It, it was Holiday on Right on Time. Yeah, because she, what they were basically doing was they sampling Saw Soul record. Right. You know, and then when she was on, Saw, and and you know it's funny in reality that's one of the biggest sampled records of all time well they were is, saying is her i was watching uh was it the making of house it was documentaries yes and um they were saying going back to what you said everybody wanted to make it their own they had over 500 different versions yeah. of this song because every dj from new york chicago they were all doing their version bringing the acapella yeah. bringing the band meshing it together and I didn't realize, see, when I was playing, I just took music as music. I didn't realize House was born from disco. When disco died, they were really redoing disco, but making it more ballsy with the 4-4 and bouncing it up and making it a little harder. Yeah. And I didn't realize just all that stuff was of House. Yeah. Well, that's wow. Well, you know. And, and reality, you know, is, I mean, I know New York City takes a huge amount of credit for, like, the underground house scene, but they're really not the originators of the of house no. music. Chicago, where these guys in Chicago were taking these records, like what you said, they were taking disco records, making it their own, and, you know, that's how it kind of evolved. And, you know, back in the day, it means... I mean, you think of Jackmaster Farley and, you know, all these guys that were coming, at, you know, Trackers and, you know, Marshall Jefferson. All these all these guys were DJs. They weren't just performers. They were DJs and they were just taking on tracks and had them own, their own. Well, that was like with, uh, remember DMC, I think it is, uh, from Europe? They came over to... Absolutely. They were the ones that came over and all the hot shots from New York, they got in their face and said, you guys suck. You don't have to talk. Yeah. You have to press the music, make it into something. You guys yeah. are terrible over yeah. here. Because back, and then when you mentioned yeah. Phil, I worked with Phil over at uh, Dominique's. And Richie, the owner, yeah. used to go, do me a favor. Could you talk? Phil don't talk. Phil was from that school. He concentrated on yeah. blending and creating, and he didn't want to say nothing on the microphone. Right when he was working at Dominique's, um, I was working at Arts Records. Okay. So it was fun. It was so funny because that's how me and him met. Because Art used to have like he he originally started working out of his base, and then like you know, right. like a select few of them were allowed to go over there. And it was kind of funny. Like, I remember meeting Phil the first time. And I'm down there. And, I, you know, and, and Art had, like, these 1,200 set up in his basement. You know, and I'm just dropping songs on there. And he's like, Phil looked at me. Now, Phil's, me and Phil have, like, a 20-year apron. Phil looked at me. He goes, man, you really have a good sound for music. And, and it was funny. I had no idea who he was at the time. And, uh, right. and Art said, he goes, Art said to me quietly, he goes, do you know who you're talking to? I said, no. I go, I go, that's Phil Mancini. I said, first thing I said, oh, he owns the haircutting place over by 
because he used to cut hair. I said, oh, he right. used to haircut in place over by. He goes, no, Sean. He goes, he was 19, like 79 or 80s Billboard DJ of the year. And I was like, what? And then it was funny when I started talking to him, he, he goes, man, you really have a great ear for music. And I said, I said, Mr. Mancini, I said, I was calling him Mr. Mancini because of the age difference. Yeah. I said, Mr. Mancini, I'm sorry. I said, but I said, you know, and then it was funny. He was asking me for recommendations of records and I just started laughing. But he was really hooked up back in the day. I didn't realize how big he was when I was working with him because I worked with somebody else at the club over at Dominique's and they were telling me. And then even Billy Hooker, Hooker was something else. He goes, hey, you want to watch how I clear a dance floor? He'll pop a slow song. He'll get everybody um, throw a big slow song on and then all of a sudden chop it right in the middle. And he goes, now they can't stand there with the puds in their hands. They got to dance. And that's right. That's how he used to repack the dance floor. And I go, only you, Hooker. Because when uh, Richie used to do the old <laughs> Widow's Watch uh, reunions, them guys would all come yeah. over. But it was crazy. Well, it's just fun. People, don't, I don't think people realize how the Widow Watch was back in the day. I mean, that was uh, before my time, but. Me too. St. Charles you know. Place. Richie had St. Charles also, and it was the same thing. Now it's. You look at these buildings and you go, how could they have a nightclub in there? They're like a two by two. Yeah. You know, even even brothers. Yeah. But like you said, with your story about Phil, my neighbor, this was hysterical. I'm talking to this guy for six months. He kept saying his band, his band. So all of a sudden I says, Can you tell me who your band is? He goes, Instant Funk. I said, Oh, I've got my made up, you come, you know, and I'm saying he's looking at me. And I says, what? White boys can't know your music? And it was funny because he got to know me first and start knowing what I was about with the music, and then he started opening up. And it's funny. I always tell Kim, hey, I'm hooked up now. When are we going to do this? And eventually we'll get together. But um, it's funny. You don't know who, especially in our area. We had a lot of the guys from yeah. Pulling the Gang, Earth, Wind & Fire. You know, <laughs> you name the bands. Trenton had the horn sex. Yeah. Back in the day. Exactly. I don't know if you know uh, Victor uh, Simonelli. Absolutely, I do. Okay. I met Victor. I worked with his cousin when I worked over at uh, WMGK and um, Magic. Uh, yeah, Magic and CTC in New Brunswick. I'm supposed to get together with Victor. I never knew how big Victor was until I started seeing some reports and L International, because back in, um, he wanted me to come down to the studio, but I couldn't do it. And he goes, he's going to Italy. And I didn't realize this is going back in the mid eighties, how big these guys yeah. are, where they were going, you know, overseas, playing to the clubs, playing their music, doing their thing, making a living. It's crazy. They're bigger than a lot of your DJs are bigger than the bands today. And yes, they are. I didn't, I didn't see it coming and I didn't realize. And I says, all Karen kept saying was my cousin's a, a producer and a DJ, but I didn't know he was one of the pioneer, you know, he was on the pioneer days of New York house. Absolutely. I just like what I was telling you before, I just have a the outlook of D like one. I don't do it for the money. I don't do it for the, you know, th I do it because I enjoy music. And it was funny, like, you know, all the guys keep telling me around here, they're like, you know, Sean, you're really good. You know, maybe you should play out. And I was like, you know, I, I like, I'm more to, you know, making, making music. But I mean, playing music is one thing doing and making it and doing it and playing it is two different things. It's kind of a weird right. thing. That's what I hate when you got your bedroom DJ playing out. It's like stay in the bedroom. Yeah. Somebody like you, yeah. you're going to entertain someone. You're going to educate them. But you like to do it for your own personal joy in a sense. Instead of going, and Correct. put it this way, the bullshit you got to deal with with these people sometimes is better to stay home. 
and deal with them on yeah, a well, that's, basis. But it's, it's listen, I, I look at it like this. Go out and play 100 songs. Okay, and maybe out of that 100 songs, somebody in this area may be only 10 of them. You know? Right. And I like to move times. I'm sorry. I, it's just the way I am. Like, I can listen to go. I can listen to style. I can listen to rap music. I can listen to rock. I can listen to this. But you know what? I can only listen to a song so many times. But then, right. as time goes on, takes that song and makes it into a modern sound. And that's what kind of catches me. It was funny. I, I, you were talking about my DJ sets that I do live. I actually had a DJ who's a local guy say to me, hey, Sean, where did you get that remix of uh, Protrusion's Forget Me Not? I said, I didn't get it anywhere. I kind of made it, <laughs> you know? Right. But I like, take it, I like to make it different, you know? I like to be different. I'm sorry. It's just, just the way I am. Now, do you do it live or do you do it pre-recorded when you're doing... No, I try... I know, like, the ones that I'm doing, uh, some of them I record, but I mix them into my DJ sets. Right. And, of course, you always get the old, oh, you know, he's cheating. He's doing this. Everybody thinks DJ this is cheating. It's not cheating. It's the age of technology. You know, back in the day when you used to wanted to do a remix of a song and Phil Mancini was good at it, to buy two copies of the record. And make it sound the way he wanted it to sound. And when you right. watch the guy play, Phil had the technology that we have now. He'd be on top of the world probably, you know. But it's it's just technology. I mean, it's it's not it's not cheats making your job easier, you know. And wow. and you know, with with technology, it's crazy now. I, I was a production guy when I worked in radio. I used to love to do the production, and. A little secret. Don't tell nobody. Some people think I can mix. I can't mix to save my life. I'm an uncoordinated drummer. I can't get the foot and the hands together. And it's like getting the ear with the, I know all the techniques. So I was working with this one kid. I don't know if you know him. Uh, Turntable Tom. He used to be big with City Gardens back in the day with uh, Randy Now. Tom was like 15, 16. He couldn't get in the club, but we used to have like ministry, all the big uh, acts before they played it on Saturday nights. I got yeah. in over there. Tom gave me a half hour show. We were on a record pool. So he says, hey, you can do your disco for a half hour. Two funny stories. One time, I didn't realize he changed the speed of the record. Next thing I know, I'm doing a half hour, 15 minute show. He had it on 45. So we played. All the, rap, all the songs, he says, just keep it on the same speed. So the 33 <laughs> to 45, and people were hysterical. We did the show twice. He says, yeah, repeat it. You've still got another 15 yeah. minutes. The other time, going back, remember uh, Duran Duran, uh, Reflex, and uh, George Cron. Oh, uh, absolutely. Dada. Well, I used to take that yep. stuff. I was a Serato before Serato came out. I take it into the studio chop it up, put it on cards, and do punch cards. Da, yeah. da, da, da. People would think we're mixing live in the studio. And it was hysterical. We kept that story for 30 years quiet. This is the first time I'm mentioning it because a couple of people in my circle used to say, don't tell them. I said, I think it's hysterical because I was the pioneer before Serato came out. I was doing what yeah. you guys are doing now. I got a question though with music. Um, it seems like it's too much co cookie cutter today, like on the radio, especially. And I'm going on my little mission with the YouTube thing. Like today's radio sucks, and I'm trying to bring out good stuff that there's not playing on the radio, or it could be even in the club if it's not appropriate. Yeah. Why do you think the cookie cutter mentality is out there? Like everybody's going Google over the weekend. I think he's terrible. I can't stand the weekend. Um, I don't. I just think it's, you know, well, we can go to Blake Blacks, you know, or like you mentioned the name of all names, Marsha Walsh, probably the greatest bliss in all of dance music. Okay. Right. 
And Black Box took her voice and put a supermodel in it or mount or lip syncing it. You know, it's a it, it's it's so much about marketing, you know, and what sells and is this gonna sell and all this other stuff. And it's kind of funny that you mentioned that. Because I always think of this song when I think marketing a song. Now, I know you're familiar with some music and uh, like, I don't know if you're Chill Rob J. We'll use Chill Rob J as an example. Chill right. J, if anyone knows anything about music, was the original I Got the Power. Okay. Snap. Like, it was on Wild Pitch Records out of New York City. Then, all of a sudden, you hear this band snap, and they're like, oh, my goodness. Oh, did you hear that new song, The Power? I was like, yeah, I heard it months ago. A year, uh, Almost a year ago, Snap came out. I said, but it's not Snap. It's Trill Rob G. So, basically, Snap took Chill Rob G's song, changed a few of the lyrics around in it, and Snap made millions of dollars, and Chill Rob G made shit. You know, because right. he was on this little ink label that only probably had, and it was funny on that on that record label there was there was Chill Rob G, and it was uh, what's the other big and DJ Premier. There were the only two guys on that label at the time, okay. and that was it. And then Snap got all, the, you know, but once again they marketed it. The ones that I'm doing, uh, some of them I record, but I mix them into my DJ sets. Right. And, of course, you always get the old, oh, you know, he's cheating, he's doing this. Everybody thinks DJ is is cheating. It's not cheating. It's the age of technology. You know, back in the day when you used to wanted to do a remix of a song and Phil Mancine was good at it, to buy two copies of the record and make it sound the way he wanted it to sound. And when you right. watch the guy play, Phil had the technology that we have now. He'd be on top of the world probably, you know, but it's, it's just technology. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not cheats making your job easier, you know, and, wow. and you know, with, with technology, it's crazy now. I, I was a production guy when I worked in radio. I used to love to do the production. And a little secret, don't tell nobody. Some people think I can mix. I can't mix to save my life. I'm an uncoordinated drummer. I can't get the foot and the hands together. And it's like getting the ear with the, I know all the techniques. So I was working with this one kid. I don't know if you know him, uh, Turntable Tom. He used to be big with City Gardens back in the day with uh, Rainy Now. Tom was like 15, 16. He couldn't get in the club, but we used to have like ministry, all the big uh, acts before they played it on Saturday nights. I got yeah. in over there. Tom gave me a half hour show. We were on a record pool. So he says, hey, you can do your disco for a half hour. Two funny stories. One time, I didn't realize he changed the speed of the record. Next man, no, I'm doing a half hour, 15 minute show. He had it on 45. So we played. All the rap, all the songs. He says, just keep it on the same speed. So the 33 <laughs> to 45, and people were hysterical. We did the show twice. He says, Yeah, repeat it. You still got another 15 yeah. minutes. The other time, going back, remember uh, Duran Duran, uh, Reflex, and uh, George Cron. Oh, uh, absolutely. Dada. Well, I used to take that yep. stuff. I was a Serato before Serato came out. I take it into the studio, chop it up, put it on cards, and do punch cards. Da, yeah. da, da, da. People would think we're mixing live in the studio. And it was hysterical. We kept that story for 30 years quiet. It's the first time I'm mentioning it because a couple of people in my circle used to say, Don't tell them. I said, I think it's hysterical because I was the pioneer before Serato came out. I was doing what you yeah. guys are doing now. But I did it the hard way. It's crazy, though. When we used to cut tape, people used to say, why are you cutting tape? You know, today it's easy with the computers. It makes life easy. Absolutely. Ah! I just got a question, though, with music. Um, it seems like it's too much co- cookie cutter today. 
like on the radio especially, and I'm going on my little mission with the YouTube thing. Like today's radio sucks, and I'm trying to bring out good stuff that there's not playing on the radio, or it could be even in the club if it's not appropriate. Yeah. Why do you think the cookie cutter mentality is out there? Like everybody's going Google over the weekend. I think he's terrible. I can't stand the weekend. Um, I don't. I just think it's, you know, well, we can go for Blake Blacks, you know, or like you mentioned the name of all names, Marshall Walsh, probably the greatest bliss in all of dance music. Okay. Right. And Black Box took her voice and put a supermodel in it or mount, or lip syncing it. You know, it's, a, it, it's, it's so much about marketing. You know, and what sells and is this going to sell and all this other stuff. And it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because I always think of this song when I think marketing a song. Now, I know you're familiar with some music and uh, like, I don't know if you're Chill Rob J. We'll use Chill Rob J as an example. Chill right. J, if anyone knows anything about music, was the original I got the power. Okay. Snap. Like, it was on Wild Pitch Records out of New York City. Then, all of a sudden, you hear this band Snap, and they're like, oh my goodness, oh, did you hear that new song, The Power? I was like, yeah, I heard it months ago, a year, uh, almost a year ago, Snap came out. I said, but it's not Snap, it's Trill Rob G. So basically, Snap took Chill Rob G's song, changed a few of the lyrics around in it, and Snap made millions of dollars, and Chill Rob G made shit. You know, right. because he was on this little ink label that only probably had... And it was funny, on that on that record label, there was there was Chill Rob G, and it was... Uh, what's the other big... And DJ Premier. There were the only two guys on that label at the time. Okay. And that was it. And then Snap got all the, you know, but once again, they marketed it. Speaking about with the European records, though, why do you think the producers, like I'm even, I'm in a couple record pools and a couple of the producers yeah. said they're, they're done playing new music. They're going back to the 70s, 80s and 90s because it's more uh, people will take that than what they want to do today because it's not in that cookie cutter. Yeah. Why do you think, why do you just, think the battle's going on? You know what? I was always, a, I don't mean to down the United States or anything, but, you know, Europeans were just always more hip to music than we were. I mean, I mean, we had our big cities. We had Chicago. We had New York, you know, Los Angeles, Vegas and stuff. You know, but I just that in my eyes, I mean, European producers always had, like, I like to call it unfound soul. Like they have the, like they know what works and they, and they know how to use it to their advantage, especially the producers. I mean, I mean, some of these, you know, like what you said, they can take a disco tune and just make it something special. I think her name is Martina uh, Dudley, Budley, or Dude, uh, I always mess her name yeah. up. She's with the Brown and Crown guys, too. I call them the law firm. They redid yeah. um, uh, in the Gang. What's this? Celebration. They, yeah. I don't know if you heard the remix. They knocked it out of the park. They added the rap to it. They made it into 2020. And I says, why isn't this song being played over here? And I wish it was something like that back in the day because I didn't really care for celebration because when you're a DJ, you played it 50,000 times. Every party you played, you had to play it. But this song, well, what they did to it. I think the problem, they only hear, they only hear the song one way. And when Brown and Crown, you know, did the, do these remixes, I mean, and I want to tell you something. When those guys do a, a remix, man, it's on. Uh -huh. They they take a super, super classic 
and make it even more super duper. <laughs> it's, it's crazy the way they do it. Oh. And it's like, that's how I think with music. And I'm like, they're doing what I want to do because that's, yeah. I guess I was brought up. I always had the ear. I ended up, uh, my buddy, John, he, he lived the dream. He worked in the post office. He DJed. When he retired, he wanted to open up a recording studio. And he basically did a lot of rap stuff yeah. down in Philly. They were over at uh, Jazzy Jeff's old studio. They were right next to each other. Yeah. My little son, he, he goes, yeah, I got my rappers coming in tonight. I said, all right. I said, I'll hang. I used to like hanging in the studio while he was recording. Oh, son, they just see this big white guy sitting in the back. They're like, what the hell yeah. are you doing here? So all of a sudden, before they came in, we were playing with some Al Hurt records and different things. And all of a sudden, Johnny was stuck. And I go, why don't you take the beat out of the third, play that Al Hurt treble we heard, but reverse it and plug it in. And add an extra beat off of this. And they're like, what the hell is he talking about? So all of a sudden, they're like, holy shit, this is good. They went in there, they recorded, yeah. they went nuts. And it was like, he can go out of the box. Ah! Oh, I can always tell when a 418 record comes on. Because it's like, oh, we still have uh, Cynthia's old beats. Let's blow the dust off of that and put new vocals over top of it or did we use this for the cover yeah. girls that's what the new freestyle i'm a freestyle guy well yeah the european i hear them also with the you know like with the mosh you got the disco that created into house but they're creating something new today because you got the new disco the old right. disco the future house this that freestyle is still right. freestyle my buddy, you probably know him, exactly. Joey B. Jo Joey Bags will hear a record. I'll let him hear it, and he goes, what year did that come out, 87? I says, no, oh, last week. And he says, that sounds like something that came out back in the day. I said, no, they're just doing yeah. the same shit. They're just doing the same it, song over and over. That's why I don't understand. Like, freestyle, you can get crazy with freestyle. Back in the day with Case, oh, was it uh, K7 when he broke off with TKR? Yeah. He, he went into that house phase, made it a little more beefier, added the rap, made the more, you know, it was more ballsy than the freestyle. Stevie B always said, I'm Stevie B and I'm going to be Stevie B. He didn't want to yeah. change. Well, I think Case, and he knew the, he knew the value of marketing himself with right. the song. His song made it to radio, like mainstream. Like TKA, their stuff was, eh, it was borderline. You know, Maria was probably their biggest song to go mainstream. Right. But like other stuff, if you weren't a freestyle head, you didn't know their songs. Uh. And they were one so, of the biggest freestyle bands around. They were probably second behind Stevie B. Right. And then uh, yeah. then the battle goes for the females. But like Lisa Lisa said, I saw her on a freestyle documentary, and it was funny because she's like the black sheep because she's on that teeter with full force where they don't consider her freestyle or the beginning of freestyle. They put her on a hip-hop. Yeah. But she said the same thing. She goes, the difference between me and freestyle, you need around 15 to 20 groups to do what I could do in one set. Because they're all one-hit wonders. They're all cookie cutter. And that's all they have is yeah. one song. You can play for an hour and a half. They can't. And it's true. Right. <laughs> Who's some of the guys yeah. you like today? But it just... like so As in, uh, as in DJs, um, DJs, producers, or somebody that's coming out with things that we're not aware of. Well, I I like I like K M is one of my favorites. I mean, the guy just the guy just knows he he just knows how to take a song, 
take the vocals and make it something great. And, you know, and I hate to say it, but like, I mean, he's just, he's just a remixing genius when it comes to taking a song and making it what he wants it to be. And it, he's just, you know, and he's a, he's, you know, he's a producer, he's a DJ. I mean, but he took a long time off because right. I think he took about 10 years off of the club scene because he was working with, uh, he was working with uh, Will, he used to be Will Smith's uh, producer for his music. Right. But he totally got you know, away from the house scene, but now he's coming back, he's coming back stronger stronger and as could be i mean the guy is just and he's you know and he just knows i mean but once again though he takes a house sound and makes it something like special and a lot of I'm people you know i mean i don't i don't know if you're familiar with mk but some of his greatest songs is like night crawlers night crawlers right. he took a song that was a art song and into one of the biggest house anthems of all time, you know. I like him. It's, I like I like Dennis Ferrer. You know, Dennis Ferrer's a, a Jersey boy, and right. he can he can hook he can hook it up too. There was a kid. There's oh, God, I, I forget his name right now. He he redid uh, Fat Bottom Girls, and he's a Jersey guy. Came out like during the summertime. The name will come back to me, but uh, YouTube ended up uh, copywriting it. You know, I couldn't promote it any further, but yeah, I says that was creativity because the one, the people that heard it, I don't know if you remember the Queen song, Fat Bottom Girls, it was no, a rock I song. He made it into like a gospel second coming where you wanted to sit there and clap yeah. your hands and get into it. And it was, and it was great. No, I've done, I've done some of my own mashups. I mean, I don't promote it as much as I should, probably. But right. that comes in the creativity of taking that song and kind of making it your own. But right. when people hear a, ma a good man, like, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> you know, but that's one thing I did learn from, uh, from this kid, from Scott Dolce, is... He will always say this, and he'll say it till this day. Any song, rock, country, rap, doesn't matter. Any song is visible in some way or form. And I don't think any, like a lot of DJs, well, now they're starting to pay attention because, you know, every song is key of music, you know. And if you know anything about music, two songs that are in the same key, whether it's 120 beats per minute or... 107 somewhere down the line they're going to go together right you know and today the computers will lock it up but for like you I, if you can't do it yourself well you know but that's that's what i was talking to you about before i mean yeah. people you know technology i mean you know because you do editing my god in this day and age editing is every person's dream because every at your fingertips, you're not cotton tape no more. You're not doing this. No. You know, now they have, you know, they buy stuff and, you know, as, as, as it's funny that you say that because I was like anti digital forever. I was probably the last guy to buy a, a CDJ. Uh, I remember at the radio station, they got a new uh, digital suite. I would not go in there. I go, can I still use the two, uh, the, the real? <laughs> you got the real in there. Can I still use that one? Or like, would you stop it and start using the <laughs> digital? It's going to be so much easier. And I'm like, no, yeah. I want to cut tape. I used to stay in the old big, uh, big house where they had the four track, the two track, and the singles. And I used to bounce tracks and this and that. And I was comfortable doing that. And um, that's like when I used to go to the... Uh, my buddy's uh, recording studio. I says, holy shit. Anybody can do this stuff. Just back it up, pull it out, move it. You don't have to cut tape or nothing. Because going back to Victor, 
on an interview I heard, he was talking about, we had a cut tape back in the day. And I'm like, yeah, I, I did two tracks. I wouldn't touch a four. You can imagine doing eight to 16 tracks cutting tape. Yeah. You know, if you're doing the regular hall, oh. them guys, you know, that's I mean, a I, skill. It's a skill. You know who was a great, you know who was great at editing? Like, I mean, you might be familiar with the guy, but he was a DJ out of California. I mean, Cameron Paul. Cameron hmm. Paul used to own this remix service back in the day called Mix It. What he used to do is he used to do all tape editing like he would make a remix and do all tape editing it was unbelievable what that used to do with a with a razor blade <laughs> that's a, when i started when i was at bills kids used to the some of the students in there used to ask me hey can you cut up my air check for me because you could because i used to get it where you used to cut the beats where you wouldn't even notice there was a splice in there and remember back in the 80s yeah Radio stations were editing songs because certain uh, words they, they still couldn't put on the radio. And my buddy works at a radio station in Tennessee, and they're still monitoring uh, some of the songs. They got to cut uh, cut some of the language out because of the Bible Belt and everything around there. It's ridiculous, yeah. but the edits <laughs> people don't realize. Even like going back with uh, film. You used to have to cut the film and everything. And I used to like it, though, because it was more of a challenge. Because you had to rock that thing yeah. back and forth. Today, you can watch uh, waves, look at the airwaves, and make sure I can cut blind now. Wave. You'd be in Go heaven ahead. now. You can expand the wave get it right down to the yeah. split second. That's what I do. And it's like, even when I'm just doing two songs, if I just want to do like 30 or 40 seconds of one song and find a decent cut to bring in the next song. That's all I'm doing. Hitting that plus button, boom, 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 to spread it out, to get the little dip. And I had another computer and all my edits, this out of the sound, I, 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 oh, 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 and I'm doing edits. And I'm like, my buddy goes, you were always good. He goes, now you got to show off because you can't even hear the audio and you're splicing like perfect. Now with the new computer, Oh God, it's heaven! I'm ready to I'm ready yeah, to get an app and learn how to mix deep records with the uh, app. Maybe I'll I'll call you up. You can tutor yeah, me. Well, that, teach me how to. It all starts with this. If you can't hear it, because I I always say now I want to I want to hear your way. What you uh, how do you listen to a new record? Me, I go to the old school. I do a three needle drop. I'll listen to the beginning. Yeah. Drop drop it like 30, 40 seconds down. Maybe hit it in the middle. If it's not talking to me by then, it has it has to do something. My toe has to tap. My head has to bob. Something has to be to make me listen more. If not, I'll throw it away. And then maybe sometimes I'll say, ah, put it away and listen to it next week. And then if it ain't talking, then forget it. But usually I'm quick with records. And everybody I used to hang with, they used to say, why do you do that so quick? You don't give it a chance. And I says, I'm usually right. For some reason, if it don't talk to you, like when I'm on my campaign now, if it doesn't do something to you, what good is it? It has to, to me, music has to talk to you. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny is I like, I mean, and there's, there's two types of, of mixing. I mean, there's guys who, I mean, guys who like to blend. Right. And then guys who I like to call it, I like to call it, you know, cut mixing, you know, but it still sounds good, you know, but I think it, I think in this day and age, a, a DJ should know how to do it, all, all aspects of mixing, you know. I mean, it's one thing to go from one song to another, but like when, when you do that, you're, like what you said, you're not giving the song a chance. But you're given a dance floor a chance, you know. It, it's a it's a hard it's a hard call. Well, I'm just talking about like say at the record pool, you get a bunch of records and you're listening to them. Like I'll yeah. sit in front of the computer for, and you're going through five six hundred records maybe because then sometimes I'll do it like once a week. I'll go through yeah. a few pools, 
and I'll do the three drop that way. And then I'll have my pile. And then sometimes when I'm rendering it, getting ready to put the shows together, I'll listen to it and I say, what the heck was I listening to back then? You know what I mean? But yeah. no, like when I'm playing the record, I'm more like the old school because I'm not a mixer. So when I used to play the dance music, I used to play majority of the record. I wouldn't slap it out. Like like you say, uh, hold the beat, boom, boom. But um, yeah. now I have a weird way of listening. I don't give people a chance. It's like going for an interview. If you don't make me smile in two seconds, I don't want to hear you. So if the record's not talking to me in that short period of time, done, off to the next one. You know what I mean? Right. That, that's why, I mean, like with you, now I know other guys will listen to the whole thing. And then they'll flip it over and listen to the instrumental, the acapella. Me, I just want to see what it's going to do on the main course first before I think about what I'm going to do with the other parts. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't listen to the... I'm like you a little bit, though. I, I mean, I could listen to a record for maybe like a couple minutes. It's not doing... I can tell if it's going to work or not going to work. You know, because you listen to so much stuff and you say to yourself, okay, this, that'll work, won't work, you know. It's, it's a very, like what you said, it's a feeling. It's not nothing else. Or you'll listen to something, you'll go, this is good for the club. This will be a good override. Yeah. You can mix it in, use it this way, but you can't use it as a main course. Like I did um, CC Peniston. I found three remixes of her song, finally. One I said yeah. is great to use as bit parts. The other two can stand by itself. And certain yeah. songs are great for that. Like Todd Perry. I just got done doing the Todd Perry song. And I says, that's a great creator. Like I can give it to you and you can blend it with something else and boost up something. Right. You know what I mean? But standing by itself, it's not going to do the job. But that was the Black Riot remix she did, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a I, I kind of no, I listen to that. Me. I listen to that early because that might that's like an all time classic house record. Right. Yeah. Just to see what they're yeah. like. Um did you listen to the uh, the horn dogs I send you? The one that yeah. was um uh Rock Steady. They redid I think it was what the yeah. Aretha. I like them. Yeah. They did three different styles. They do horns. They're from uh, France. Yeah. What they what they're doing is like I listen to those versions too, and what they're doing is they're trying to bring back that pal style, where it's like a little bit more energy with right. you know with the rap to it. But anyway, I want to conclude yeah, today the before we get bumped off, and then I'll talk to you later. And just want to thank Sean. And also, you can catch Sean when he feels like popping up on the DJ Chronicles on Facebook. Remember that word that I used? Ego. Don't think you're better. Don't think you're above the music. That's all I got to say. How's that? The dance floor is now open.